And uh, it's important to recall that we humans do not always agree with each other. So a simple example is just taking into account which year it is. Uh, according to different cultures, we celebrate different years. Uh, by our conventional wisdom, we are in year 2017, but uh, according to the Jewish community, we are far beyond 5,000. And just looking at uh, when we celebrate New Year, whether you're in uh, Russia or India, uh, China, uh, Tibet, you celebrate uh, the New Year <coughs> at a different date. And of course, according to the Mayans, the world should have ended in 2012. So it's really a, a matter of convention, but it's all resting on, on that aspect. Uh, every human endeavor relies on, on convention. So uh, that begs the question, uh, where does knowledge come from? And uh, so I was trying to say that it's really depending on how we celebrate New Year, and it's all about the matter of convention and that this type of conventions uh, really helps us push knowledge forwards and uh, it's really a matter of trying to understand what do we know and when do we know it and a typical example of this is uh, our perception of time and space so I covered time in the earlier slides but uh, I frequently travel between uh, uh, North America and Sweden and uh, on airplanes they show these maps and uh, they frequently show this map which shows uh, Africa very small in the middle of uh, uh, the map and then Greenland is really big and, and bloated on, on the north. Uh, in reality uh, Greenland is really small. Uh, if you're looking on it on this uh, screen you will find it at the bottom. So there are two perceptions that I'm trying to challenge with this representation. The first one is uh, the surface correct map of the world, which shows that in fact Africa is, is much larger than Greenland. And the other one is uh, that there is no need to put Europe in the center of the world, which is probably a bias that came from the 1600s uh, when such maps were being drawn using the Mercator Convention. and. Uh, uh, there's no reason not to put Australia on the top of the world. Uh, so obviously this map comes from Australia. And that really uh, makes us think how do we make assumptions and uh, in the past uh, five to ten years we ended up uh, using Google for just about everything. And uh, we really do Google everything and in effect we allow the Alphabet Corporation to prioritize facts. Uh, since Google decides what we find, uh, we rarely scroll uh, past the next uh, 10 entries in, in a Google search and uh, rarely question the validity of what do we find. Some people might remember that uh, in the 60s or 70s there was a high school kid that uh, came up with a really good solution on how to build a nuclear bomb um, and it was all based on books that he had available. Uh, these days, if you even search uh, how to build a nuclear bomb, you probably trigger a lot of uh, uh, agencies will try to knock on your door to find out what you're doing. Uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, the flow of science and uh, what is available are uh, somewhat controlled. And this clearly impacts uh, how we do science. Uh, the other problem that I find uh, as a uh, scientist and educator is that most textbooks just give you regurgitated answers without really explaining the process of science and how we end up finding new things and rarely do we encourage critical thinking. And personally I'm not anti-Google, uh, I'm just pro-awareness. So what I'm interested in is if something really matters to you, uh, you should consult the original uh, work and uh, not rely on other people's reviews because even that type of information tends to be biased. So it's useful to cross-check information from multiple references and uh, to try to come up with a way to process that type of information in a manner that really works for your project. It's also important to recall that uh, even the word discovery, which is a synonym to research, means you're finding something that was previously hidden. And uh, in particular in, in medical arts, uh, this is important because it may lead to cure. 
the other problem is that we rely uh, on facts, but uh, occasionally there are alternative facts that uh, come into play, and uh, we face confirmation bias, and surely this has been written about. But uh, the problem is we frequently end up searching for something, then we find something else, and we often rewrite the narrative to say where we were always searching for a prime, therefore we found it. And uh, we tend to retroactively bias uh, the way we discover things without uh, acknowledging uh, serendipity and uh, how we actually stumbled on, on the things that we discovered. And uh, uh, the other thing that's a problem is that uh, people lie. And uh, in science that happens as well. Of course, there are uh, papers being retracted. Uh, it's not always the case that the papers that are being retracted are actually tagged accordingly. So uh, when you search uh, PubMed, uh, uh, I'm not really sure how many of the papers that are being retracted have a little red bar that says this paper has been retracted. So that can be a problem in the way we, we process uh, science. Uh, we also have that same problem with machine learning uh, models. Uh, we frequently think, well, my model would have been really good if only I would have had that little variable. But the problem is you can't really uh, proactively do time travel and predict things correctly. So that's, that's always a problem. How do we derive meaningful predictions? So the take-home message is that we really rely on a lot more data. Uh, Embiggen is actually a word uh, used in a Simpsons episode uh, uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, because this is uh, a BD2K initiative, I thought I should uh, really toss out the question, how reliable is big data and how much of it is true? And uh, of course, the answer depends on uh, which set of data you look at. So from our perspective, uh, the illuminating the drug will genome uh, initiative uh, was prompted by a commentary uh, from a team led by Al Edwards in uh, 2011. And uh, his take was, okay, so it's been 10 years since we sequenced the human genome. How many new targets uh, did scientists start working on? And the answer is not too many. Uh, in fact, uh, at the time of this writing, 75% of proteins were focused on 10% of the genes that were previously known. So NIH uh, started the Illuminating Drug Bull Genome, and uh, I've been part of this initiative uh, for the past uh, two and a half years. And um, one of the things that we've uh, developed uh, as part of IDG is uh, a comprehensive way to catalog information and knowledge. And uh, that led us to classify uh, proteins according to what we call the target development level. And uh, it's a protein classification scheme that does not take into account primary sequence, but rather takes into account uh, a variety of sources of information and gives us an idea of what we know. So the 3% that you see roughly at 3 o'clock, uh, those are a mode of action targets uh, for approved drugs, and I'll come back to those in a minute, and it's about 3% of the human proteome. And then the 6% that are roughly at 2 o'clock, those are TCAM, which are proteins for which we have small molecules that modulate uh, these proteins. So if you think of it this way, pharmacology and biochemistry are pretty much covered by that thin slice that's roughly 10% of the proteome. And then as you move uh, backwards uh, in the inner ring, uh, T-bio is, um, I'll define it in a minute, and then the dark uh, that we have, T-dark, uh, we have uh, several criteria to look into that as well, which I'll mention. So uh, with TCLIN, I promise to get back to you, but the way we discovered or annotated TCAM is to look at uh, uh, approved drugs and their bioactivities according to two separate sources. One is Campbell, which is maintained by EBI, and the other one is Drug Central that we maintain at UNM. And what you see on this uh, dotted uh, box plot is uh, bioactivity data for drugs annotated by mode of action. And these vary quite dramatically. So for kinases, uh, the dot that's at 7.7 .7 
which is roughly uh, 30 nanomolar, uh, indicates that 90% of the drugs that act as kinase inhibitors are captured by that low cutoff. That changes dramatically if you look at uh, ion channels, uh, which are the second to the right, uh, and that's 4.6. We roughly approximate that as being 10 micromolar, and that potentially has to do with the way these drugs have been discovered and with their uh, lipophilicity profile, so the fact that the uh, ion channel uh, blocker resides uh, in the membrane where it's locally concentrated and effective against the, those ion channels. So affinity plays a role, but not the only role when it comes to uh, good drug properties. Uh, going to the other two categories, uh, with T-Bio, uh, we say that if you have two out of three criteria that uh, map you into T-Dark, if you are above those two criteria, then you end up in T-Bio. We make exceptions for uh, experimental evidence code according to the uh, Gene Ontology Consortium or uh, if you have two or more publications that confirm a phenotype associated with disease in the online Mendelian inheritance in man database. So with T-Dark or the Ignorome, uh, we look at the fractional publication count uh, from Lars Jensen. Uh, I will explain a little bit more about that in, in the next slide. We also look at the NCBI gene riffs or reference into function. Uh, this is a bit like uh, Twitter. In 255 characters, you have to describe uh, protein function. And then we also count antibodies according to antibodypedia.com. So how do we count these publications? The equation is uh, shown on, on the right uh, of the slide. We essentially uh, adjust the number of papers uh, per protein, or the numbers of proteins per paper, as it were, uh, by looking, uh, so for example, if a large-scale analysis discusses 10,000 proteins in a single publication, then clearly that publication is not about one protein, so we divide that publication by 10,000. If uh, that publication is dedicated to one protein, then we count it as one. So this is based on uh, text mining, a technology called named entity recognition, and uh, this is going through uh, by now 27 million abstracts uh, from PubMed. And you can tell from this box plot that there is a clear uh, difference in the median between uh, T-Dark, which is on the right, uh, the median publication count is 0.3, and then it goes two orders of magnitude higher for uh, the other three categories. We see an interesting phenomenon when you look at uh, antibodies versus publications. This is also done on a per-protein basis. Uh, there is a sperm and rank correlation of uh, 0.68, which indicates that the more papers you have, the more antibodies you have, or the less antibodies you have, the less papers you have. This is a uh, chicken and egg or a causality dilemma problem. Uh, but essentially, uh, the more antibodies you have, the more tools you have to characterize a protein, which means the more papers will be written about that protein. And uh, we can only note that uh, this equation, or not equation, this correlation breaks down for uh, T-Dark. So if you were to eliminate T-Dark, uh, sperm and rank would be even higher. And uh, we then ask the question uh, of these three criteria that we use to define what's in T-Dark, and I'll remind you, it's uh, publication abstracts, so PubMed abstracts, uh, gene riffs, and antibody counts that you see on the left side on the screen. So the other four are externally validated uh, criteria. Uh, the first one is just counting the experimental evidence codes, uh, so the leaf nodes out of the gene ontology. And you can tell that uh, even for those, there is a significant difference between uh, T-Dark and the rest. We also look at the NIH reporter uh, and mine uh, roughly 42,000 R01 grants between 2011 and 2015. And we ask the question, how many uh, proteins have been funded and uh, by what amount? So again, uh, there is a difference. We also look at patents. 
the number of patents covered is in the millions, uh, roughly 7 million patents. Uh, this is di data generated by the Campbell team at DBI, which is part of our grant. And then our sister knowledge management sister at Mount Sinai, led by uh, Avi Mayan, uh, they developed this uh, project called the Harmonizome, which extracts uh, um, experimental data from uh, about 70 publications. So it's 110 data sets which they put together. So this is a matrix. And uh, when you compile all that experimental data, even with experimental data, there is a difference between uh, TDARC and, and the rest of, of the proteins. And uh, we did uh, the done test uh, after Cruz Calwales and uh, essentially except for the differences between TKM and TCLIN, which are absent uh, based uh, on these four criteria. The other ones are statistically significant, so we clearly have a signal that indicates that uh, TDARC is uh, severely understudied. And uh, we're not surprised about the lack of difference between TKM and TCLIN. Uh, that type of evidence that would progress a target to a mode of action target would come from uh, clinical trials and uh, that's simply not uh, well captured by this type of data. Uh, we also note that uh, this is something that uh, continues to happen, so this is not something that, this is not a static picture. So for the entire year of 2016, uh, one of the most popular uh, databases for uh, looking at proteins and their relationship to other targets is called STRING. And if you look at STRING, um, you can look at it two ways. The first one is whether somebody searches a protein by name. Uh, and in that case, which is on the right side, when you search a protein by name, it's clear that uh, T-dark proteins are being queried uh, by lower amounts compared to the other three categories, uh, but also from leaks from uh, Uniprot or OMIM or uh, uh, NCBI system, uh, you still see a lower number of uh, uh, papers or papers, protein leaks being accessed from the string database. So clearly uh, TDARC is subject to less uh, inquiry or curiosity as it were. This brings us to reformulating the causality dilemma, uh, are TDARC proteins underfunded because there is no interest or because uh, uh, this lack of knowledge is perpetuated by lack of funding? And uh, we hypothesize that maybe it's because we don't have chemical probes, we don't have antibodies, so we can't really categorize these proteins in a good manner, which leads to that situation. But at the same time, uh, it quite happens that when somebody uh, proposes to study a protein that nobody really knows about uh, to NIH, uh, it's quite likely that there will be uh, uh, discussions or debates in the study section uh, because they'll say, well, why should we fund uh, studies on a protein that we don't know anything about? So at the end of the day, because there is that conservative aspect, uh, there will be uh, less likelihood of being funded if you uh, are interested in a dark protein. Uh, we looked at patents, as I mentioned earlier, so uh, one way to look for additional evidence with respect to chemical matter for uh, understudied proteins is to look at the patent space. And as you see between the two overlapping circles on the right, uh, the number of chemicals covered in patents which are uh, exemplified in patents uh, is one order of magnitude larger than what's published in chemical genomics literature, which is represented by Campbell. And so we started a process to examine uh, patent space. Uh, we looked at uh, patents that were uh, awarded uh, after the year 2000 because that's when patents became digital. Uh, that way we avoid uh, uh, errors due to optical character recognition. And uh, we focused on T-Bio and T-Dark uh, primarily because we assume that the other uh, uh, proteins uh, have been well described. 
so at the end of the day, we ended up looking at uh, 99 patents and uh, we were able, so this is work done by uh, Anne Hersey and her team at uh, EBI, we were able to recapture about uh, almost 21,000 biologic uh, activity measurements on more than 11,000 compounds. Uh, and that includes uh, more than 200 targets. Uh, the data will be rolled into the next uh, release of Campbell, so this will uh, become publicly available for anyone who's interested in this. Uh, and uh, those of you who are interested in the IDG program, there is a phase two. Uh, the RFA went out uh, in November, and uh, in that RFA, there are about 400 proteins that are mentioned by uh, gene code, uh, H, G, and C symbol. And out of those, uh, we found some uh, that uh, were uncovered by patent data extraction. For instance, the patent on GPR6, uh, I just uh, learned last week that uh, that patent contains uh, valuable information, and it's not published anywhere else. So this literally would indicate that there is valuable <coughs> information in patents that it's not that does not end up in PubMed or in the main publication stream, uh, which would be worth uh, recovering. So does that lead us to ask the question: Can we start to systematically mine uh, patents to address the issue of how do we recover uh, pre-competitive knowledge? Because uh, m most people who are interested in dark proteins would really like to know uh, what's out there. And uh, uh, some people would say that patent data is not peer-reviewed, but at the same time, we know that. Uh, if you go to court to defend your patent, unless you find a way to prove that what you wrote in the patent is true, you cannot uh, have a valid patent. So uh, there has to be a signal in, in, in that noise. Um, and then I also reference Anne Hersey's work, which uh, shows that more than 50% of the data that's published in patents does not end up in peer-reviewed papers. So again, uh, it's probably worth looking into this. Uh, our own consortium is considering examining additional patent data in the future. Uh, we know that uh, there is the Open Targets uh, Consortium, uh, which uh, is uh, composed of uh, EBI, the Sanger Institute, uh, GSK, and uh, Biogen. So these four entities have combined to look at uh, targets in a different way. And then Mike Gilson's BindingDB project also is looking at patents, uh, specifically for patents past 2014. So potentially there are a number of entities that are interested in collecting patent information and making it available. So uh, this might end up into Campbell and eventually in Pharos. And uh, I'll get back to Pharos in, in a minute. Uh, do we really care about proteins that are in T-Dark? Uh, what you see on, on the screen uh, are uh, five uh, proteins, uh, leptin receptors, modent uh, sphingosin 1 phosphate, auxin receptors, and uh, BCSK9. Uh, these are proteins that uh, pretty much 15, 20 years ago were uh, in the dark. Uh, they were not well described. And then somebody published either a deorphanization uh, paper or a strong signal associating that protein with disease. And then uh, by 2015, we had drugs on the market. And I also added the granule receptor, which was TDARC uh, 17 years ago. A successful clinical trial was uh, finished in 2016. So potentially, there will be another drug approved. Uh, which indicates that on average it takes between 15 and 20 years for things progressing from T-Dark to T-Clean. Uh, one initiative that does go further than others is the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium. Uh, these are data extracted from uh, mousephenotype.org. Uh, I apologize for not putting that reference onto the screen, but if you're interested in uh, uh, the links, uh, so this ALPK will actually take you to mousephenotype.org. Uh, so we prioritized the genes for uh, IMPC, and uh, out of the 
120 T-dark genes, they uh, produce 45 mouse lights and in particular this dark kinase ALPK3 seems to have increased uh, uh, perinatal or embryonic lethality but the surviving adult, adults have severe heart defects. And uh, there is another protein which is an addition, uh, G protein coupled receptor called ADGRD1 and that one has uh, skeletal uh, phenotype defects uh, such as decreased bone mineral density and these are just two examples of the uh, significant phenotype calls that have been made on uh, proteins that we helped uh, prioritize. The other caveat is that uh, in, in my opinion this is a quote from uh, Lenat and Feigelbaum uh, who are knowledge management uh, experts if you don't know very much to begin with, don't expect to learn a lot quickly. And so the take-home message from this is that there is a knowledge deficit and uh, two out of five proteins are in uh, what I call T-dark or the poorly described part of the proteome uh, and about 10% of the proteins uh, in t -clean and t -chem are currently targeted by uh, small molecules. And if you're going to study dark genes, uh, you need funding and patience. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and tell you what uh, more about uh, mode of action uh, drug targets. Uh, this is a project that uh, we developed uh, at uh, UNM um, and uh, it's called Drug Central. Uh, the reason we started this project was that we were interested to have an accurate mapping between uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, which is what scientists call drugs, and pharmaceutical formulations, which is what uh, patients and pharmacists and physicians call uh, drugs. So these two worlds don't always overlap. And uh, as you can tell from this screen, we map a variety of uh, uh, properties depending on where we extract the data. Uh, importantly, we try to relate uh, indications uh, from the approved drug labels, which are on pharmaceutical formulations, back to the uh, active ingredients, and then we want to map all of that uh, onto drug targets. And so, in the process of doing this, we uh, just uh, uh, cataloged all the molecular drug targets uh, that are available. Uh, so this project took us about uh, seven years. We ended up uh, doing it in parallel with uh, a team at EBI led by John Overington. Uh, the publication just came out uh, in January uh, this year, Nature Drug Discovery. And uh, this particular plot illustrates the innovation patterns per therapeutic area. So you are looking at the anatomic therapeutic uh, classification uh, system which is uh, maintained by the World Health Organization and if you look at this circular histogram and kind of squint you'll see that most of the circle has a bluish tint and the bluish tint suggests uh, that most of these targets have been introduced to the market by means of of course approved drugs. Uh, before 1990. And there are a few pockets of innovation uh, between 2011 and 15, uh, mostly at uh, 7 o'clock, which is antineoplastics and immunosuppressants, a little bit at 6 o'clock, which are the direct acting antivirals, and then roughly at 1 o'clock, uh, the diabetic drugs uh, and antitropotic agents. So those were the pockets of high innovation in, in the last five years. Um, if you focus then on the highly druggable uh, or privileged uh, drug target classes, uh, most of the innovation again occurred in the area of kinases uh, with a little bit of innovation in the GPCR field, uh, whereas nuclear receptors and ion channels have been a bit more stagnant with just about 2 to 3 percent new drugs being approved uh, in the last five years. Uh, but this allows us to ask additional questions and uh, because we have mapped these molecular drug targets, uh, a question that was asked by uh, Bisan uh, al-Lazikani and Paul Workman was 
how much of the high impact publications in cancer overlap uh, in terms of uh, molecular drug targets. And uh, there were two studies that were published roughly at the same time, uh, roughly the same number of genes and the same number of genomes. Uh, and so out of 3,000 genomes and uh, 12 uh, tumor types, the overlap uh, ended up being uh, 58 uh, genes that overlap with the cosmic cancer gene census and the two high impact publications. But, so if you take this uh, cosmic uh, cancer drivers and you ask the question how many uh, known uh, molecular drug targets uh, overlap with this, uh, we end up with 38 uh, that go from oncology drug targets to uh, cosmic. And uh, this is of course uh, not a great situation. It probably suggests that a lot more work needs to be done uh, to try to map this. Uh, potentially some of these cancer uh, drivers are loss of function drivers and so you can't really target them. Um, and of course the other uh, situation is that a lot of these uh, new studies uh, need to be taken up taken up by the drug discovery uh, scientists in industry and academia. So maybe there will be a time to catch up. But another way to ask the question is uh, which of these cancer, which of these targets are uh, used in cancer and which are not. And um, to my surprise, uh, there are currently, to my knowledge, no ion channels that are annotated to work on, on cancer and very few GPCRs. Uh, conversely, a lot more kinase inhibitors have utility in cancer than uh, not cancer. And uh, the speculation that I have as to why this happens, particularly for ion channels, is that uh, cells need to be differentiated and uh, lots of cancers do not have well differentiated cells so uh, maybe uh, those ion channels are not uh, a good target for that reason. The other one is that we typically want to kill not modulate uh, cancer cells so probably ion channels are not an ideal target class for that uh, purpose. Uh, but the other question is, well, how about all those cosmic cancer drivers that might be in the what we call T-clean and T-chem category? And uh, what you see here is a uh, two-dimensional plot based on publications and data types. Uh, so the more publications you have, the more to the right uh, on this plot, and the more data types you have, uh, the more up on the screen. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, all these targets could potentially have uh, immediate utility in cancer. We have uh, drugs available for them. Uh, some of them are ion channels, so I don't know if they will work, but a lot of them are actually kinases and not ion channels, so they should probably be prioritized uh, for further study in, in cancer. Uh, Another way to look at the data is to ask the question, what's the commercial impact uh, of target classes? So for this, we teamed up with uh, a company called IMS Health. They collect uh, point of sales data from uh, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, across the world. So we looked at data from 75 countries over a five-year period. Uh, the total market is roughly three trillion dollars. Uh, so what you see on the sales column are in billion US dollars. These are aggregated over a five-year period. And uh, if you look at uh, G protein coupled receptors, uh, 372 drugs over 72 targets, uh, roughly 0.9 uh, trillion dollars. So they are the most commercially successful class of targets. And then you have enzymes, nuclear receptors, transporters, etc. Interestingly, uh, if we would have done this uh, analysis on data from uh, 1996 to 2000, uh, neither kinases nor cytokines would have made this plot. So those two categories have been up and coming in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, 
and this is a different visual for the same uh, data types, uh, essentially looking at the ATC plot after having eliminated the anti-infectives because we only looked at human uh, drug targets. The outer circle on these concentric circles is 250 uh, billion and the most uh, lucrative areas are in cancer, uh, the LO1 and LO4 chapter, uh, the uh, CNS drugs, so the nervous systems are more diffuse but they are the second most lucrative target class. Uh, so that's roughly at uh, between 9 and 10 o'clock. Uh, but they're just more diffuse, they're not as tall as, as the other ones. And of course diabetes and uh, the proton pump, so ulcer and uh, diabetes uh, also uh, are highly uh, lucrative according to drug sales. And this just illustrates uh, the top 20 drug targets by revenue. Uh, this pretty much reflects uh, disease patterns from uh, patients age 65 and older. Uh, so rheumatoid arthritis, uh, admittedly that goes for younger people as well, but then you have diabetes, uh, COPD, which is the glucocorticoid receptor that includes asthma and as well as dermatologic applications and then the statins. Uh, proton pump inhibitors and then you go to blood pressure. Uh, surprisingly, the opioid receptor does not uh, make it in the top five. I don't think that reflects actual sales uh, or usage. It probably reflects uh, what's being dispensed through the legal system. So, of course, it does not include the recreational drugs. Uh, the same goes for the cyclooxygenases, so COX-1 and COX-2. Uh, those drugs are so cheap that uh, probably by units dispensed uh, they would overtake. Uh, so pain medication would probably be on top of this if we looked at number of units being dispensed. But unfortunately we do not have that type of data available. So this is just looking at uh, revenue. So. In my opinion, there are many unexplored opportunities, uh, particularly with cancer drivers and drug targets. I think that overlap with double uh, in the next five to ten years. And the other thing that I put on the screen is how many uh, human diseases do we address with therapeutic uh, agents? And uh, the answer is probably around 15%. And the way I got to that number is we took the data from uh, Lynn Shrimble's and Warren Kibbe's database, this is ontology.org, uh, to which if you add all the rare diseases that are not in that database, you end up with about 15,000 disease concepts and then roughly 2,500 have therapeutic agents. So a lot more work to be done in, in that respect. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, tell you uh, just very briefly how we mined the data from the Federal Adverse Events Reporting System. So the FDA maintains this database where you, anyone can report side effects associated with a drug. It's a very complex database. Uh, we eliminated out of about 86 million uh, drug adverse events repairs, uh, pairs, we, we eliminated those that were not suspected to involve the drug. So that leaves you with about 36 million uh, drug adverse event pairs. And uh, out of those, we looked at those that had a proportional reporting ratio of two or higher. And that allowed us to map these reports to unique drugs and unique MEDRA terms. And if you're not familiar with MEDRA, it's a controlled vocabulary specifically developed by, uh, I think it's Karolinska in Sweden for the WHO, World Health Organization, and it's a hierarchical vocabulary for uh, side effects. So if you take that MEDRA vocabulary and uh, convert it into a matrix, what you end up with is just counting the association between drug pairs and adverse events. You end up with a matrix that gives you uh, 2,374 drugs over 1,200 targets. And if you take that matrix, you can visualize it with uh, stochastic nonlinear embedding. Uh, this is a cluster that was uh, developed by Christian Bologa in my group. And uh, it's available live, so you can uh, play with it if you want. 
Uh, but what you see in what we call cluster number five, which is on the left-hand side, uh, there are a number of uh, targets which are uh, neighboring each other, some serotonin and adrenergic receptors as well as uh, monoamine transporters, but also including gl glucocorticoid receptor. Uh, these have to do with CNS side effects. And uh, if you look at these, there are different ways to cluster targets. Uh, so cluster number seven is primarily tyrosine protein kinases and uh, cluster number four are primarily serin threonine kinases. Uh, and this literally gives you an idea of what targets might have a similar uh, side effect uh, when, when you modulate them with uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, and then a different way to look at the data is to mine uh, patient records. Uh, so on the right hand side uh, you have a little snapshot from a publication which was, I was part of which uh, looks at uh, temporal disease trajectories. This was work done on the Health Population Registry of Denmark. Uh, roughly uh, 6.2 million people over a period of 15 years and uh, the numbers that you see going from essential hypertension to renal failure indicate uh, so 27,000 patients progressed from uh, disease 1 to disease 2 uh, over a period of at least 30 days uh, but it's between 30 days and uh, 15 years and then from renal failure to tubular function disorder. So that was the third disease that was accumulated by individuals with renal failure. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's, uh, the question was how many uh, patients had what other disease five years prior to developing uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease, which leads to renal failure. So it's pretty much the same uh, type of question. And you can see that essential hypertension is on the top of the list. Then you have diabetes, um, chronic heart disease, um, or what they call ischemic heart disease, uh, congestive heart failure. So the short of it is that the pattern that we see in Denmark, we also see in Health Facts, which is a database that we have access to at the University of New Mexico. And Health Facts, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, has about 62 million patients data being collected from uh, 608 hospitals. So it's de-identified data. Uh, the other question that we were asked uh, was what about Alzheimer's? So what are the diseases that uh, our patient is diagnosed with uh, prior to Alzheimer's five years prior? And again, we see a similar pattern, hypertension, diabetes, uh, hypercholesteremia. So then uh, it literally asks the question, can we begin to look at the disease Alzheimer's in combination with all these existing comorbidities? And uh, this is an important question because it might uh, give us uh, a different insight into how to treat these patients. Uh, to my mind, uh, especially if you go to CKD, uh, you might want to have a different approach uh, to treat renal failure if your patient had unspecified essential hypertension versus uh, coming to you with uh, peripheral vascular disease or congestive heart failure. So uh, clearly the treatments would, would be different even for the CKD component of that. Um, I also tossed in this quote uh, from uh, Derek Angus, who's an editor uh, of JAMA, uh, and he uh, made a comment on a publication that uh, relied on big data, uh, and in that particular publication they were saying that uh, intubation uh, makes it worse when it comes to the outcome of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And uh, the question is, do physicians agree with that? And as an editor, he said, well, I looked at the paper and it's all solid, but uh, my uh, impression is that that does not appear to be the case. So the question is, when is uh, big data really big data or is it rich enough? Do we have enough information to ask the right questions or do we have just snapshots of information which give us uh, just impressions of what we think is, is the complete picture? So in, in his opinion, 
the temporal aspect of uh, the data that was being examined was not detailed enough to lead to the right conclusion. Uh, so, uh, what he called residual confounding. So, with big data, I think you have uh, some uncertainty, even great uncertainty, particularly if you do not understand the context of the data and uh, if that data is not meta-annotated accordingly. And in particular with clinical data, I think it can be very tricky. Uh, and when you look at the federal adverse reporting system, it's, it's even worse. Uh, so, in, in the last section of my talk, I want to introduce you to a system that we developed, which we call TINEX, uh, Target Importance and Novelty Explorer, which is available at the website newdrugtargets.org. Uh, it will give you a two-dimensional plot. Uh, on the x-axis, it uh, plots novelty, which is roughly one over the number of publications. So, in short, the fewer publications you have, uh, the fewer number of publications you have, the more novel the target is. And then on the y-axis, it plots what's called importance, which is a way to evaluate the, uh, how strong is the association between a disease um, and uh, that particular target. So, if you have, for example, 100 publications that talk about uh, insulin receptor and uh, 100 publications to talk about diabetes. If the overlap is 10, then that uh, association would not be regarded as strong. But if the overlap is uh, nearly 100, then that uh, overlap will be very high. And that's what you would see when you navigate this system. And uh, you can search it by uh, disease. You can also query it by target. You can also search uh, targets within a disease plot, so if you type in, say, Alzheimer's, it will find it at the prompt and uh, then you can ask the question, well, what's the relevance of that particular uh, protein? So in this particular case, uh, what you see uh, is if you search for leukemia uh, and then uh, somewhere in the middle you will find this target called uh, timidilate kinase. And if you were to click on that for more information, it would uh, give you uh, a little summary about leukemia and then the publications that relate uh, timidilate kinase uh, with leukemia. And it's up to the user of the system to decide whether they want to believe those publications or not. Uh, so we cannot make that qualitative judgment uh, and replace critical thinking. We actually think critical thinking is important. And uh, in a more recent version of uh, TNX, we actually included the automated link to Pharos. And I noticed that uh, Raj Guha is the next uh, speaker uh, to the links webinar series. So I'm not going to tell you a lot about Pharos, but just gives you a glimpse. So the knowledge summary that you see uh, in the middle of the screen, that's data from Avi Mayan's harmonizome. It's just a visual way to represent how much knowledge we have about that protein. And then on the left-hand side, you can see uh, R01 uh, funding. And if you scroll down, you can actually see the uh, grant numbers that are funded. So it might be of interest to you to contact those investigators if you're particularly interested in a protein. It also gives you an idea how much funding uh, has been allocated to, to the protein. Uh, PubMed scores, we also have, uh, which is not represented here, we have a visualization of tissue distribution, so a lot of expression data that we catalog as well as other information. Uh, I think uh, Raj will tell you more about it uh, next week. But this allows you to ask the question, well, how about, uh, is there any relationship between um, drug targets uh, uh, sales from uh, pharmaceutical industry and uh, R01 investment. And uh, we try to look at this. The size of the dot uh, is directly proportional to the number of drugs that are available for each target. But you can clearly see that there is no uh, direct relationship between uh, sales and uh, R01 investments. So, Pretty much the NIH funding is an imperfect system. Uh, we did 
text mining for all the NIH grants, extracting the data from NIH reporter. Uh, so that data suggests that roughly uh, 9,000 proteins uh, receive zero funding from NIH. And uh, about 6,000 of those are in TDARC with 2,600 in TBio. But interestingly enough, some of them are in TKM and in TKLIM. So uh, some of this explanation may be that either that they are all targets or they are simply funded elsewhere. And of course, there might be errors in the way we do the text mining. Uh, but I also think that uh, industry, so either the Open Targets Consortium or uh, companies uh, should look into those uh, 9,000 proteins. Uh, so my take home message on that is just because something is ignored, it doesn't mean it lacks importance. And uh, we need to have a strategy to search the unknown uh, deliberately. Uh, a lot of ink has been dedicated to the fact that uh, pharma industry follows fashion. Um, in fact, uh, data clearly suggests that most lucrative drugs on the market are not the first-in-class drug but the best in class and often the best in class comes uh, second or third uh, or even number seven. So uh, Lipitor that for a long time was uh, best selling statin uh, was the seventh statin to make the market. So it's not always the first drug that uh, rigs the uh, financial benefit. So from a pharma industry perspective, it's better to wait and let others be innovators and then you come up with a follow-up or a me-too drug and, and then uh, you make uh, uh, more uh, benefit. Uh, I'll end up with a few remarks. Uh, I think we're facing a conceptual fallacy, which is the separation of science by organ or cell. Uh, this comes uh, historically, I believe, because uh, medicine has this separation, so they either treat cancer or infection, which is a separation by disease, or they treat uh, uh, an organ, say cardiovascular medicine or ophthalmology. So that separation, of course, is important when you run a hospital or you acquire a specialty because you need to learn all you can about uh, that particular organ or disease. Uh, the problem is when you organize science that way. Uh, this is reflected by the way NIH institutes are organized as well as the way pharma companies work being organized by what they call therapy areas. And uh, we all know that uh, pathways, proteins, genes don't care about such separation. So I'm not really sure that this mental divide has been properly evaluated and uh, its impact in science. The other thing that I wanted to, you to consider is that diseases do not have a physical manifestation outside patients. They are concepts. And because they are concepts, uh, we really need to keep our research patient-centered. So as much as possible, we should look at uh, phenotypes and, and patient data and try to derive uh, new science. Uh, and the invitation to focus less on animal models and more on mining patient data comes from uh, Castalia, uh, which is Herman Hesse's book, uh, uh, that uh, Horobin wrote about in a Nature Drug Discovery paper in 2002. If you haven't read that paper, I encourage you to look at it. Uh, another paper that I really like is uh, from uh, uh, Viktor Lazebnik. Uh, it's how a biologist would describe a radio. And uh, the conclusion that uh, Victor has in, in his paper is that uh, because biology lacks a quantitative language, uh, it makes it difficult to process and understand facts. And uh, I won't go into details. I'd rather encourage you to read the paper. It just uh, illustrates how removing one or two components out of the radio, you cause the radio to malfunction and you draw all sorts of conclusions based on that. But if you don't have the proper picture, then you can't necessarily understand what's really happening in, in the radio. So my uh, invitation, which I plan to put in, in some sort of publications, is that I think it's time to acknowledge that target selection is pre-competitive knowledge. Uh, 
drug industry that fuels a lot of target prioritization and selection, their reward system is, is based on patents, but patents don't come from targets. They are uh, based on uh, medications that make it to the market. Uh, and so, to my mind, uh, pulling uh, efforts together makes sense. And uh, there already is a uh, consortium. It has uh, two companies and two sort of European partners, which is Open Targets. But I think uh, maybe a uh, international target selection consortium uh, would make sense. Uh, part of it would be to support this so-called double-blind studies and thus avoid the reproducibility crisis. Uh, oh. You may, you may recall the publications from Bayer and Amgen which uh, showed that uh, as little as 11% of what was published in high impact papers was reproduced by pharma industry. So this is uh, our knowledge management center. We uh, mine uh, patients, patents and papers as well as proteins and diseases uh, and uh, we try to map this in relationship to drugs and to point out new directions. And uh, I'll end up uh, putting these names on the screen. These are uh, individuals that contributed to the IDG uh, initiative uh, from the University of New Mexico, uh, Center for Protein Research in Denmark, uh, the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, NIH and CATS and the University of Miami and um, I don't know what the format is but I'm pretty much open for questions. So I guess my uh, take home message is that we really want to partner between academia and industry uh, to do this sort of uh, focus on understudied proteins. Um, there simply isn't enough NIH funding to cover this. Um, at the same time, when you look at uh, funding patterns uh, across NIH, uh, there's roughly uh, 9,000 proteins that have received uh, zero funding according to text mining. And of course, the system is imperfect, so maybe 100 or 200 proteins may already be well funded, uh, and that would be the type of error we see. But we use the different systems like uh, Poptator and uh, the disease tagger that uh, Lars Jensen has developed. So we don't think we are completely in error on, on this aspect. Uh, and uh, with regards to patents, we actually looked at a, an additional text mining software which pretty much painted the same picture. So even in patents, a lot of proteins that are in T-Dark are not subject to patents. Uh, does that mean we should ignore them because if they're important they've already been discovered? The answer is no. I tried to show that with uh, these uh, five to six proteins that were clearly in T-Dark uh, 20 years ago and now there are new drugs on the market. So yes, it takes a while to take that information forward but I think it's worth looking into it. That was, that was a great presentation. Um, I guess the question, uh, one of the thoughts that just came to mind, I mean, uh, many thoughts came to mind throughout your presentation. One I was thinking of was, of those T-DARC um, uh, targets, uh, how many of those, what percentage would you estimate maybe are just uh, targets that are considered to be undruggable and, or where you cannot develop an animal model for the, that particular um, protein? Um, you know, because it's like, a, you know, phosphatases, for instance, are considered to be very difficult to drug. Pharmaceutical companies don't want to address those kind of things because they're they're difficult, they cost a lot of money, it's a hard problem to solve. They'd rather go for something easy where they can make some you know money quickly. It's a good question. Uh, the, the problem is how you define undruggable and uh, I'll remind you that uh, as late as uh, I think 1996 kinases were considered to be undruggable. So uh, is it possible that in 10 years from now we'll have drugs for phosphatases? I would think so. Yeah. Um, but of course it's also possible that some targets are simply not druggable. But uh, the other thing is that uh, even this uh, process of what's druggable and not is evolving. We think of it as uh, addressing things with a small molecule, but as you 
no doubt know, uh, we now have uh, biologics which don't, you don't really need to have a binding pocket. Uh, all you have to do is have a good antibody and uh, a way to kill the function of the protein uh, that is expressed. Uh, the other thing that's probably up and coming are these RNA technologies uh, that will probably end up uh, silencing genes and, and thus uh, causing loss of function. So I think in the next five to ten years we'll probably find new therapeutic modalities which will end up in, in the market as well. Uh, so what's undruggable, I think even that very definition is changing over time. Yeah, I guess what I was kind of thinking though is that, you know, what we could currently, you know, the, the, the targets are, they're considered undruggable, you know, and so, you know, people just, you know, research tends to focus more on, I think, the the things that are, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit that's easier to study. And, and when you don't have an inhibitor and when you don't have, you know, something that you can, you know, modulate the, the activity of that particular target, it's difficult to research. I agree. I think what's going on is that uh, a lot of these targets that are in the dark are considered undruggable, but at the same time the problem with them is that we simply don't know uh, anything about them. So occasionally there might be um, 3D structures, and if there are 3D structures available, then of course one could potentially use uh, more classic definition of drug ability to approach them. And uh, Oleg Ursu in my team has looked at that from the perspective of uh, binding site similarity using software from OpenEye. And uh, we can clearly see that at least for kinases and serine proteases, there are some proteins out there which are not, uh, they don't have a drug on the market. Uh, they're not even known to have an inhibitor, but we think you could easily come up with a small molecule that would bind to them, just based on pocket similarity. So there are some low-hanging fruit out there that are literally in the dark, but shouldn't be. Doesn't look like it, so maybe we can wrap it up then. <clears throat> uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Udor, for yeah, fantastic you for talk. Mind. It was great. Uh, okay. Uh, let me know when you post this online and uh, uh, let me know if you want the slides. Uh, I was just going to send them to Sherry Jenkins, if that's okay. That's fine, yes. If you just send it to Sherry, that's okay. Uh, All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.